So the, the main the, the main message here is in the in the top, which is viruses don't discriminate, and and neither should we. So for so people from a specific nationality or population or region of the world might be discriminated against, even though they may not be at increased risk of having the virus. Likewise, people who have been released from uh, quarantine may be stigmatized, even though they're no longer contagious um, or at risk of spreading the virus. And we can take some act we can take an active role in combating the stigma as a community and as individuals. And some of the things that we can do are to recognize that coronavirus, it doesn't recognize race, nationality, or ethnicity. And um, coronavirus did start in Wuhan, China, but it's just a location. And ancestry or ethnicity is not a risk factor for contracting the virus. Wearing a mask does not mean a person is sick with COVID-19 and combating stigma by sharing accurate information about, about COVID-19 is an important step we can take. Um, and saying something, be an active member of our community, saying something if we see, read, or hear misinformation or discriminatory information. I can imagine we've all heard or directly perhaps experienced uh, an effect of, of discrimination in, in, our, in our lives in the last couple weeks, and this is an opportunity to speak up and take an active role against that and show empathy and support for those most closely impacted, for our loved ones, for our friends and our colleagues. And there's uh, more detailed information here, like I said, on the, in the Google Drive. Thank you, Christy. Mm -hmm. And now, um, Dr. Basu will, <laughs> will talk about how, um, about how to talk to, uh, to youth about um, COVID-19 and its impact. And this is also a document available on the Google yes. Drive. This is also available as a handout in the same Google Drive. Um, so just to give a quick overview about the information, um, you know, this is really in response to commonly asked questions by parents over the years um, following major transitions, uh, severe stressors, or potentially traumatic events. Parents often wonder, how do I support my child who may not be cognitively and certainly not emotionally potentially understanding things in the way adults can or even access information? Sometimes parents wonder whether they should even talk about these things. Um, and of course, we know, uh, you know, children vary a lot um, in terms of their intellectual and cognitive understanding as well as emotional functioning across different developmental stages. And so the signs and symptoms of how children may be affected by stress can look very different at different ages. So for instance, with infants and toddlers, um, most of these manifestations are likely to be more behavioral. And even though they may not have um, words at uh, when they're infants and toddlers, they can pick up on whether a caregiver is worried or anxious or upset. And so uh, they might respond in turn um, and you know, look more fussy than usual. There may be changes to sleep or feeding routines. So consistency, which is a theme that we talked about even with adults. So familiarity in routines, in caregivers and environments is helpful for everyone, but particularly for younger children. Um, with children who are older, um, generally uh, research from other serious medical conditions has shown that open and age-appropriate communication is helpful um, because children are already experiencing or observing some of the uh, changes in their environment or uh, their parents' kind of emotional functioning or their parents' anxiety. So helping them have words um, and what to name something and having a framework to talk about it is important because it allows them to ask questions and explore their own emotions. With older children, uh, especially adults, they are cognitively processing information much like adults, and they are often getting information um, from school, from social media, and online sources. And um, even though it is typical for adolescents to often reach out to uh, people outside of their family, particularly parents, both for information and emotional support, uh, the fact is that it can still be overwhelming and sometimes inaccurate. So parents still have an important role in supporting um, adolescents emotionally, um, modeling appropriate limits around media and internet use, and um, can invite them to join in and in watching the news and discuss 
uh, you know, what information they've learned. I would say the key with adolescents is to listen, listen, and listen some more. Um, <laughs> And then uh, the rest of the handout sort of has some common themes around questions that have come up. So what kind of age-appropriate language can I use? So there are examples of that. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is children are often worried about things that are quite specific to them, and those concerns might be different than the adult concerns. So they are much more likely to wonder about changes to the family, so if there are canceled trips, visits to you know, other family members, uh, birthday parties, and things of that sort. Um, we do recommend, generally speaking, uh, the research does recommend that uh, we can provide realistic reassurance and validate children's feelings. So it is understandable that they are worried, and here are some things that we can do that we know doctors are telling us can be helpful. So focusing on things that they can control, much like things that other speakers talked about that adults can do, so washing hands, um, you know, how to sneeze or cough, um, and as appropriate with slightly older children, even sharing that um, so far what we know from scientists is that this virus does not make kids very sick, but it can make some grown-ups very sick. Um, some kids can also understand that um, hygiene behaviors doesn't just help them, but it actually helps everyone, and that can help them feel calm and more in control. Um, overall, for families, positive active coping mechanisms can be helpful, um, so reading, playing, and really trying to stay connected emotionally to people they care about. So echoing some of the other recommendations for adults, even if you're not meeting people physically, um, writing le emails, letters, uh, um, you know, video conferencing. I think this is an occasion where technology can be utilized in creative ways, um, you know, to support connectedness. Um, and then finally, I would just say that uh, parents have an important role to play in helping the children avoid blame and stereotyping, asking children what they might have heard from friends, and helping them understand that um, blame and stereotyping can have uh, negative consequences for everyone. For example, people may be less likely to talk about symptoms they're experiencing or to seek help. And so uh, this is, these are, of course, risks for bullying and stigma um, and can be uh, pretty, uh, not just emotionally uh, damaging, but can have a lot of other negative um, consequences. Um, final note, um, I I think parental self-care is central to supporting children, and so I think adults allowing themselves uh, some time uh, in their own routines to think about really what is it that they want to share with their children, um, talking to other adults, um, and being mindful of their own emotional responses um, is key because what affects uh, grown-ups usually affects children, so I think self-care is very critical. Um, I recognize that every individual and child's uh, history is unique. Um, if you have, if you, you or your child have a pre-existing medical condition or pre-existing mental health condition, uh, speaking to your primary care uh, provider is critical. Um, as with all the information discussed today, um, none of these guidelines or recommendations are intended to replace um, either medical advice or public health recommendations. Um, so it is important that families speak with primary care providers for more specific testing or recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Basu, would you, <laughs> would you like to say a little bit about the like media use in kids and what, I know you have that on your handout, but I just know yeah. that, that I have a talk that's a little bit of a presentation of mine. But, but. Yes, um, so I mentioned, so certainly if are, uh, school age children gen limiting uh, TV and media exposure or it being supervised is key so and I think um, in a, you know being available to talk to them about it um, with older kids um, and adolescents I think as I was saying the key is to listen so asking them well who are you talking to so Vizu and I were talking today you know he's a, he's a faculty in the Department of Epidemiology at Harvard and his daughter is telling him no no dad this is what I heard from this friend, or you know, something along those lines. And I think that's a pretty typical uh, scenario as I imagine for you, Kirsten. Yeah. Um, and I think talking to them both about what are trusted websites, 
so uh, for younger kids, it might be talking to school teachers. With older kids, it might be specific age-appropriate websites. Um, I didn't put this on the handout, but my son is much younger. But there are actually great PBS kids uh, specific episodes that focus on germs and hand washing. Oh, and I don't know if it was in response to these recent changes, but they are available online for free now, um, even though they're older. So kids can actually uh, see some uh, media that is actually helpful and gives them strategies. Um, and then the other piece of it is talking to um, adolescents about the emotional consequences because excessive media use and focus can be anxiety provoking and quite counterproductive. Um, I think parents can model that by themselves limiting media and internet use at times or suggesting alternatives, um, you know, healthier alternatives. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else want to say anything? Okay, so now we'd like to open it up for questions. If people um, have questions, if you can use the chat feature on the Zoom, um, that would be great, um, just because we have so many people. And um, I know from experience doing this call that some people's internet is variable. Um, so, um, so just while we're we're um, getting people's questions, or if you have suggestions on what things uh, we could do, um, we we're, we we're open to that. So I can tell you a few things that are in the planning. Um, talking to folks at the Center for Health and Happiness at Harvard at Harvard Chan, um, um, we've been talking about doing some webinars on resilience and um, having some speakers and we'll be planning those and since many people will be working from home people will be able to access those hopefully um, and also um, folks at Mass General are planning a brief intervention um, to improve resilience so there's a lot of work around that going on that we'll be sending out and um, so people can access some resources um, so other other questions yeah, so okay. there's a question about whether the Harvard University Health Services is planning to offer mental health counseling to students while they are off campus. A few of my students have concerns. Um, that is a very good question, which um, we will write down and get the answer to, because I actually don't know for sure um, what the plans are in terms of offering that. Um, one of the things I know the faculty at, at Harvard Chan have talked about is whether we can offer some um, group group um, sort of uh, video calls or Google Hangouts um, that would be would have people on them that could sort of be sort of a way of getting social support and also getting information. Um, so I think that's a great idea. And if the person who asked it, um, anyone can follow up with me individually on my email at k k o e n e n at hsbh.harvard.edu. I'm easy to find, so um, we'll definitely follow up on that. Um, I'll just add, we are also going to have, we are putting together, which and it will be available after this call, a resource list that um, we developed. Um, so there's just a couple of examples, but the Parkness Hospital System does have a COVID-19 specific hotline and it's not restricted to patients or providers, it's open to the public. Um, so certainly folks can call there. Um, and then SAMHSA has a dedicated helpline as well, um, a national helpline. Okay, thank you. So there's a question whether there is a list or to continue to receive the information. Yes. So that is another good question. <laughs> <laughs> I keep looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really. Um, as you go along. Yeah, yeah. We, will, we will be creating, we will create a listserv. Um, and um, the best way to do that would be um, for people to email me um, their email and say they want to be on the listserv, and we will be creating a listserv. Um, and we will also be sending out, many people who are on this call are on various listservs, so you'll also be getting it, uh, getting information through those. We can also funnel um, like, a, like a form yeah. through the same way we funnel through. Yeah, okay. So that yeah. you're not getting all the information. Yeah, okay, perfect. So there's a question about if you have any resources or recommendations for providing psychological support to care for adults in quarantine conditions mm -hmm. or seniors who may be separated from their support network due to restrictions on access to long-term care facilities mm -hmm. or closure of senior centers. 
Yeah, so that's something that has been on. So I would like, if people also, people can text, uh, put their ideas on. I'd like to hear from folks. This is something, actually, another reason I didn't mention that I wanted to do this, because I have a, my mom is 78. She lives, she's widowed. She lives alone in Atlanta. And um, I was going to go see her, but now I can't really travel because I'm worried about if I travel, then I won't be able to get back to my son, et cetera. And um, she also has a history of being depressed. Um, so um, usually when I talk to her, my, my conversations are like, what are you going to do today? Where are you going to go? Are you going to church? And now she's been told to restrict activities. Um, so I think that um, the initial ideas I have are mainly around how can people connect with seniors um, other than seeing them in person and making um, making a an effort as individuals and families to call, write. I mean, it's really old school to send cards and write people, but write to write them um, and video chat with them and um, at least kind of get them on the phone to get folks talking. I think that's the initial thing. And then other things, and this is all I'm talking as like a daughter less than as a professional here. The other thing that's done with my mom is um, food of areas. For example, she really likes uh, puzzles. So sending her a puzzle, um, trying to help her figure out other activities she can do besides watching the news um, to keep herself busy while she can't go out as much. I don't know if people have other ideas for senior suggestions. I think those are great suggestions and consistent with what we're seeing even in the hospital. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, because uh, for, uh, you know, but I think the risk really is with younger folks being asymptomatic potential carriers who might expose people who are more vulnerable. Yeah. And so physical distancing for elderly and those with medical conditions seems like a much higher priority. Yeah. Um, and so I think the examples you gave are actually great. And, so another question is, what might be ways staff engage with student groups to keep their spirits up and engage, so building community in the face of social distancing? That is brilliant. <laughs> so I'm turning to the brilliant young colleagues. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is, so just this morning we were talking about the challenge of and the opportunity, really, for um, the, the many ways we can communicate through social media, uh, Zoom even. Today, we have 96 people attending a meeting that, um, that you know, wouldn't be able to normally. So, so there's, there's an opportunity to, to, um, to come together through different ways. It has to be, and, and social media is an amazing opportunity to do that. The question is how. So there's um, many counselors offer more um, telemental health, so counseling over the telephone, over Skype, over video chat. These can be, uh, it's dependent on the provider and it changes state by state what those regulations are. So, um, but there, there is an existing infrastructure to provide psychological support and services through telephone and video chat. And this is something that can really be leveraged now. And the question is, we were sort of brainstorming on how to scale this up so that it can reach a sort of a, a, a broad community. And, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. It's a, it's a public health challenge. But there is infrastructure there, and there is a precedent for how to do this. Um, one of the ideas um, a, a, one of my colleagues in infectious disease recommended was um, whether faculty would volunteer um, to have um, groups or group chats or Google Hangouts or Zoom calls with students. So for example, I do this for prospective students because I get too many prospective students for our programs, but I can't talk to them each individually. So I just schedule, I schedule Zoom calls and send out the information and whoever joins, joins. So um, we could see in terms of student services, we could see if faculty, kind of like we have our our lunches with the faculty or whatever offer those kinds of things to students. Um, I think that would be actually, I actually think my colleagues would be, some of my colleagues would be interested because honestly it makes us feel better to be doing something. The other thing I can say is, um, you know, faculty need guide, maybe need guidance on this, but most of us are planning on continuing all our advising and everything by Zoom or by video if we, um, if the student's able to do that so that the students, students who leave or go home or who aren't here will not be 
isolated. So just like classes are continuing, continuing our other work online, um, I think is really important. And then I think the other piece, which um, I'm sure student services is aware, but there's a number of students who are feeling challenged because um, they, for example, live in dorms and they have to leave and they may not actually have a place to go. Um, so I think that is a big um, challenge, meaning they can't easily go home or some students are just in life circumstances where they don't really have a home to go to. Um, and these are, these are more anecdotes I've heard, but that is something that um, I think as faculty would be nice for us to know where, you know, we're, usually we send them to student services, but some of those kinds of things. I don't know if you, if you have thoughts on this. No, but I think there is a response yeah. oh, to uh, one of the questions raised earlier. HUHS is still open for students that are in the area if they need help. Uh, it seems like they also have access to telehealth through IHOP network. Okay. So we'll, you know, call response things mm -hmm. through chat um, in the list. That's yeah. Yeah, and I did quickly go to the site, their individual community provider, um, and so contacting those directly, and they offer uh, services over the phone be a great idea. Um, and I know is moving towards um, health um, as well, right? Yeah, we are um, looking into kind of doing virtual visits, but that's still something that NGH is kind of figuring out how to best implement that. And um, so that's that's something that is certainly. Um, I think your different progress. decisions are uh, variable on that. So uh, the Department of Psychiatry as a whole is one of the larger uh, users of telemedicine. Uh, and in our division, we've been using that pretty effectively, like even during major snowstorms or times when um, in other departments where there are mobility issues for patients. Um, so I think that uh, for some practices, it might, it might be scaling up, like you said, mm -hmm. but there are providers working uh, already um, using the partner platform. There's a different question here, which is in disasters, we always see an increase in domestic violence and substance use. Do you have any resources or recommendations for state and local officials to combat this trend? That is a very good question. Um, and we can add those resources. I mean, we definitely we do have them. I mean, many of the people who are, pretty much everyone who's in this room um, does work on related to violence um, and abuse and things like that. So we actually have those, um, both um, and in between our students, we'll have them for kids and stuff. So we could add that. To the, to the resource information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Child supervision is going to be very important. Yes, yes. For yes. Working, single working parents. Right, that's yeah. the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Williams have talked about child supervision, and um, I've been thinking, um, I'm, a, I'm essentially a single mother, but my, my son is 12 now, but um, I've been thinking a lot about what if he were six, like what would I do? Um, and so how to support working, how to support parents, single parents, um, whether or not when the ones that are, are going to be still working, like healthcare workers, et cetera. Ian Williams, this question might be for you. Is it likely <laughs> that graduation will be canceled? <laughs> 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 um, you know, it is part of our discussion and our planning um, with very little evidence um, to support a certainty as to when. Um, we might be able to abate this outbreak. Um, I'd have to say we are planning and preparing for the inevitable um, inevitability of having to do something other than what we've routinely done for commencement. But it's too early um, to really provide any uh, more specificity to my response. And I think you know, just from what I've heard from epidemiology colleagues, part of the reason for proactively um, imposing social distancing and doing those measures so that um, we can at least buy time and be able to resume normal activities um, at, the, at the end of May. Yeah. Is that part of the, the reason? That's part of the reason. I mean, the social distancing is a real important intervention in this moment. And I want people to remember that it worked in some cities during the uh, 1918 mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. Uh, for example, I think it was Kansas City that decided that it was going to impl implement measures to allow for social distancing to keep the epidemic curve 
lower. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, on the other hand, chose to ignore the recommendations to implement social distancing, and Philly ended up having the classic epidemic curve that overwhelmed its healthcare system. So there are lessons that we can learn from 100 years ago uh, that uh, tells us that there is a scientific and appropriate reason for us to have uh, um, faith, trust, confidence in this public health intervention of social distancing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question. If the situation gets longer than we think, is there any timely intervention step by step? I'm worried that people who are positive at the beginning are easy to give up hope when the situation feels endless. Yeah. That is, um, yeah, I think that's a big challenge. And, so, and, that, uh, and we have the uncertainty now because we really don't know how long yeah. this will this will last. Um, so I think that is that is partly where we're working with colleagues to um, um, disseminate. And I know, like I said, at MGH, they're developing um, interventions or like short-term interventions to improve resilience, mm -hmm. sort of. Um, and and um, over time, I think that the things I can say we know work, and I'll have other people join in are um, in sort of, you know. Disaster is maybe the exactly right word, but disaster situations where there's extended consequences are um, remember yourself that this is a marathon, not a sprint. So importantly, really taking care of yourself and keeping routines. This is really important, obviously, for kids, but it's important for adults too. That even if your work's disrupted or your you know you don't you don't have to get up as early, you don't have to actually keeping your routine as much as possible. Taking advantage of, I was hearing reports from people in Italy on the BBC, like taking advantage if, um, you know, even if we're implementing social distancing, you can go outside, um, getting outside was now that the weather is actually much nicer. So really being really um, rigorous about taking care of yourself in the ways that you can so that you maintain your more positive attitude over time. And then another thing I think can be very helpful for many people is, um, you can think of something you can do for someone else that will help someone else. So, um, for example, if you're, um, you know, if you're on a neighborhood, you know, a neighborhood email list, um, could you organize, um, could you send information to people or organize a call with people there? Or, um, um, you know, I think other people may have other ideas, but if you can do to yourself some things that you feel are positive for yourself and your community, that will help you feel better. If you know someone who might be isolated, um, for example, I have a staff member who had to self-quarantine, um, you know, checking <laughs> checking in with them and saying, you know, and, and seeing if there's something you could do for them, whether if you could send them something. You don't even have to have context to drop something off. So I don't know if other people have other ideas on how to keep spirits up. Structure, one of the things you're talking about is structure. And I think it's yeah. important, especially in relationship to children. I'm wondering if it might not be useful for people like us to create some sort of workshop for teachers uh, because the kids connected with their teachers very much. And the teachers, when children are uh, no longer in class, they can conduct certain kinds of things with their students because they have a relationship that's been ongoing and it will keep that structure going. So maybe we need to create some training for teachers on how to manage that and what they might do and what kinds of projects they might create for children. That's a great idea. That would be really great because I know um, I mean, my son is at Pierce School in Brookline. I'm sure there's other people with kids, and that's a K through eight school. And I know they're struggling, you know, they're scrambling generally, but I think that, yeah, if we could do things for teachers and then provide, provide ways for them to do that with the kids. And, That'd be great for parents too. <laughs> yeah. I think parent teacher sort of partnership um, can really help with um, what you're suggesting because um, even in terms of maintaining routines, there are ways in which parents can work collaboratively with teachers to have similar routines at home. And actually, a lot of the suggestions that are noted for essentially caregivers and parents. Um, there are versions of this that are available for teachers that we consult with schools on. 
um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to add to what you were saying earlier in terms of sort of maintaining essentially your emotional stamina because it, it could be a marathon, um, is that I think also, to me, it has also highlighted kind of the unique aspect of um, aspects of every kind of community because across the nation and across the globe, we are all affected by it, but the way it affects each of us in every individual community can look pretty different. Um, and I think that, that um, like in our neighborhood, yeah. for instance, you know, this was such a small thing that happened, but, um, you know, we were ordering some supplies, which we were actually ordering for routine use. Um, but we realized that there was all this kind of panic buying and panic ordering. Um, and we also knew that, in fact, there were some families in our own condo building who were, you know, busy with just life as usual. And so we ordered some supplies for our neighbors as well. But to them, it felt like this care package that came but seemed to reinforce this sense of community. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, what we need is probably something that our next door neighbor or, you know, your uh, child's uh, friends, parents also need. Um, and I think there are ways in which you can highlight and build on the sense of local community. Yeah, that's a great idea. I want to give a shout out to one of our former postdocs, uh, who is a faculty in, in Korea, um, Sanjay. Yeah. Sanjay, if you want to unmute yourself and if you would like to share um, what you've shared by tape. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, forgive me, this is a... 4 a.m. in the morning in South Korea, so oh, my would not that be sufficient to convey some of my ideas in these wonderful people? Right now, um, in Korea, I mean, Korea was like a, the second most prevalent um, uh, coronavirus country. Now, we, uh, the Italy exceed us, <laughs> thank you. But um, we are now suffering for like more than 50 days of this outbreak. And what I feel very strong was that even though I, I am majored um, the mental health and mental health epidemiology, this is a very epidemic, is a very social um, one. So I know that in Korea, um, we have a lot of um, things done by the psychiatrists and psychologists to intervene the, um, the, the mental health for the quarantine people and also for the general public. And they may have made a lot of um, campaigns and conveyed a lot of information like um, how to release yourself, how to um, relieve your stress, um, how to um, com communicate with others without physically. Um, but uh, things were not that, um, I mean, like it was, it was not very easy. Right now in people in Korea, I think they are suffering a, a, a kind of chronic burnout. Yeah, and, the, and the most of the thing was from the media. And the media, I mean, I know they're, um, I mean, they're, they're really important because they are conveying really good information, but somehow they are too um, overheated. So too many kind of fake news arise. And people, do, people confuse what should they have to believe. And there were some sort of um, groundless um, therapies people have to believe about that and then they people buy and urge for that. So I think um, the number one thing for in this in the society to lower the, the society anger or society anxiety is to check whether this news is valid or not and people to discern what, what information they get, they have to discern if it is valid or not. And that, that will lower the anxiety level, I think. Number two was the supply. And the, the very best supply that we were concerned about was the mask. I know that the US um, did a really good um, kind of a mention by the, the, the Surgeon General or um, like um, the mask is for the, um, the more professional um, needs and like general, they don't need to wear masks. But in Korean and more Asians, in Asian culture, wearing masks is more than, it's like culturally meaning more than what um, people others think. So people, people think that if you wear masks then no germs can um, get into my body. So they, they, think, they think that is the, the most, the best protection. 
I don't know if it's scientific or not, but that's what people, some, some people believe like that. So um, many people um, wanted to buy masks more and more and more, and people thought, and people were very allergic because actually five years ago, we experienced the same thing, the MERS virus, which is the same family of coronavirus. And that time point, the fatality rate was 35%, which was really high. And we, we have experienced that kind of situation. So now when the coronavirus take in, people get really allergic to this kind of epidemic. So the, the, the first thing they did was buy all the masks. And now nationally, there is no mask. There was no mask that people could buy uh, properly. So there were many, many um, appeals to government. And now we sell only two masks for one week for one person with the ID. Um, so, and when, the, when, when, when I saw that, when I went into some sort of shop, which I can buy a lot of you know, masks before, and when I see there's empty, and now I could feel this is a tor turmoil, <laughs> the social mm -hmm. turmoil. But mm -hmm. instead, and, and at, at the beginning, people also bought so many kind of foods. And they think it was like a war. So they, they bought food. But, uh, but the public got more easier to that because um, um, let alone of the mask, but, but, uh, it, it, but all the food supplies or other uh, utensils were okay. So people think, okay, well, it, now, now it's, this is a problem of mask, but not for the other um, foods or, you know, the things you need will be okay. And then, then people get a, a relatively okay about that. So, um, yes, yeah, so um, right now we are, um, we want to find something, the procedures, which may intervene also for the individual, but also for the message for the public. And I think strongly the public system should um, do something for the public mental health. This is a really public situation. So it's like um, you can intervene, just, just say, okay, relieve your stress, um, just do something this and do that too to individuals. But um, I, I think like this community or society or like the government should do something mental act to kind of um, deal with this kind of public anxiety. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Sanjay. Much appreciated. Um, maybe I'll take two more yeah, questions. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, one is how uh, do you have any recommendation resources for uh, psychological first aid care for first responders? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have resources. Yeah, we, yes, we have resources on that, and we can add them. Um, the, um, the resources I know off the top of my head, although I can't say the whole URL, is through the National Center for PTSD, um, which is, if you Google the National, I think if you Google the National Center for PTSD, it brings up the website, and they actually have just great resources all around, although it's a place that's focused on veterans, folks there really develop psychological first aid, so that is one place. And also, I'm sure the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has those resources too. SAMHSA. <laughs> SAMHSA, which is SAMHSA. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a question about practicum. Um, that's, that's beyond this room. So I think anybody who has questions about courses practicum, you should directly contact your uh, faculty member. Yes. Um, I think that concludes our question. One, one more question. Oh, okay. Um, um, okay, so this is a question uh, that's asking about resources for dealing specifically with loneliness during social distancing, particularly for people who live alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that this is um, a com I'd like, like to hear other people's um, um, ideas about this. So I think this is where we as a community can help and not just leave it on the individual. So I think if you live alone, then um, I would advise that if you, that you, like, you find, you think about people who you would trust to let know and make packs to check in with you. I know that might feel very vulnerable and hard to do. And um, I can promise you as a faculty member, it may seem like weird to tell your faculty, but 
I personally and my colleagues, would, most of us would welcome it. You'd have to use your judgment on that, so share that. Um, and then um, I can tell you that you're not the only one who lives alone. So I have a lot of people in my, um, who are in my group broadly who live alone, um, some from different countries um, and who haven't been here very long. So it's not from England, who's only been here a couple months. Um, and so um, what we're doing and many, what we're doing is um, getting contact information. And so if you're someone who's lived in Boston a long time, you don't live or you don't live alone, you have a lot of connections, think about how you can connect with other people. So the member of our group who's on quarantine, I've been texting with him, um, seeing if he needs anything. And he's been letting us know that his partner, like his partner has come back and is letting us know. So we can both be proactive about asking for help, but then also think about in our groups and the people we work with or that, oh yeah, so-and-so, she just moved here. She might not know that many people. Um, and then, um, reach out that way. And that's also where I think that as a school, we could, or as a community, whether, because I know people are from different places, if folks wanted to offer to have um, group um, calls and things, that there's ways that we could offer to, to create some community. Um, so you could do that yourself, or um, I also think we're working with the school to see how we can do it as a school to offer it to more people. Some of other ideas too. And the other thing is, unless you're, unless you're strictly quarantined at this point, we are allowed to leave the house. And um, I do encourage people, if we have to keep the social distancing, that's really critical. But um, that doesn't mean you can't go for a walk outside. And again, I was hearing stories of this grandmother in Italy who has her whole family with her and they would take turns going outside, like who'd get to go for like walk on the block, getting up early and doing it before too many people are out or doing it so just so. Um, Sometimes that can help, even if you don't get to talk to people, at least you get to not be so isolated. I don't know if people have other ideas looking at. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Um, we are going to be creating a Google intake form. Okay. And then so we can put that in the Google folder that I'm about to share. Okay. So that um, within there, and anyone who wants to give us their email address, or if they want to ask questions or anything, we can. We can do that and we'll create some kind of, um, we'll either add to a list or we have or create some kind of list or for all this yeah. information. Um, so yeah, so, so Shaylee is going to share the Google like drive folder that we've created, which has all the handouts that we've um, shared today. It will have other things that people are at, like our people are adding and um, as well as have the Google form. We also have, we haven't talked about this, but Shaylee did a really nice job of pulling a lot of the, um, scientific literature on um, mental health and epidemics. Um, so there's, for those of you who want to geek out, there's, um, that is in there. You can geek out a bit on it. Um, and we'll provide more information there. So. And also for anyone who's probably led the, um, the Zoom meeting a little bit earlier, please feel free to share those resources so that they could fill out the form yes. and be able to access the right. Google Drive with the resources. Yeah, so share the, um, share the, uh, the things that we share are shareable. Everything we share is shareable. So don't you don't need to ask, just yeah. share it. That's yeah. what we want to share. Some of you are on different emails where I'm emailing things around because people have asked for emails, forward it, et cetera. If you need um, a Word copy, a Microsoft Word copy of something or make, you want to make something, you're going to use our material but change it for your own context, please do. You have our permission just to use the material. So. Great. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.